Hey guys, I'm Andrew Townsend with eLearning Brothers. This video is a recording of our webinar, Up to Speed, Secrets of Reducing Time to Proficiency. If you enjoy the kind of content we're creating here on YouTube, please subscribe, like the video, or leave a comment. And if you haven't already, check out our new free trial um, at eLearningBrothers.com. Thanks so much. We hope you enjoy this presentation. Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar. My name is Andrew Townsend, I'm with eLearning Brothers. Today we're gonna to be talking about up to speed secrets of reducing time to proficiency. This webinar will be recorded. We'll get a copy of it sent out to everyone in attendance and we'll also be posting a copy of this uh, webinar on our blog later in the week. So you can find it there and if you'd like to show it to other people, you're welcome to pass that around as well. If you have questions during the webinar, please use that questions panel. It looks like some of you have already found that. Uh, just go ahead and chat in your questions and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Just so you know, one of the things that we like to do after the webinar is try to follow up as soon as possible. Sometimes it's just to get feedback. Most of the time we would like to see if anybody needs one-on-one -on -one clarification about our webinar topics after the fact. So uh, you can expect an email that will have some goodies and a couple questions as well. To talk to us about reducing time to proficiency, we have Marty Rosenheck, our Director of Talent Development development and consulting here with eLearning Brothers and Steve Rosenbaum, founder and CEO of Learning Paths International. Thank you both of you for uh, coming and, and sharing your time with us. We're excited to hear what you have to share. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the screen over to you, Steve, and the time over to you, Marty, to tell us more about our guest. Great, well, thanks so much, Andrew. And I'm very excited uh, to have uh, Steve uh, join us. Um, he, I just wanna tell you really quickly a little bit about how we met. Uh, you know, Steve will tell you we met in, uh, you know, in a bar in uh, Tijuana, but that's not true. We met um, uh, mainly, actually, I, I read his book first, and, and Steve, what's exciting about him is that he did, he literally wrote the book on learning paths. As, in, as a matter of fact, he wrote two, and there's a new one that just came out, that Up to Speed book. And, uh, and by the way, we'll, in that email that Andrew mentioned, there's going to be a link to that book. Uh, so you, uh, actually, a, down, a downloadable link that you can link, uh, get that book if you're interested in the Up to Speed book. And it's very good. But the thing is, so I, I read his earlier book, Learning Paths, uh, many years ago. And my background is in cognitive science and studying how people develop expertise. And I started building a tool, which is the Trek Learning Experience Manager, which you now eLearning Brothers provides. It manages and tracks learning paths and the on-the-job learning pr process. And uh, I read his book, you know, early on and thought, this, this guy knows what he's doing. This is good stuff. And I came to that kind of type of thing from the cognitive science perspective, studying how people develop expertise, kind of top down. And Steve came to it, I say, I would call from the bottom up, you know, in the trenches, from the quality movement and, and figuring out very practical ways to do that. And we kind of met in the middle because okay? it's really the same. We came to the same conclusions from two different directions, which to me validates the whole idea of it. And uh, so someone introduced me uh, who is doing research on speed to proficiency, introduced me to Steve. I said, oh, yeah, I know his stuff. And, and then and he told Steve about me. And then a minute later, he called and we've been uh, working together ever since because what he what I found is that he's got a great methodology for 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 doing learning paths to reduce the time to proficiency, and we have this tool Trek that is a way to use automation to make that that um, that path uh, uh, make it easy to track and automate that whole process. So so I'm very excited to have Steve here, and we work and partner together, and so I'm glad he's here to share his wisdom on uh, getting people up to speed. So thanks, Steve. Uh, thank you, Marty. Um, welcome everybody, and we're we'll have a, a nice uh, 40 minutes to an hour here, just going through the methodology. I want to let you know this is something we've been doing now since about uh, 2000, and we've probably worked on now more, probably more than 600 different jobs, tens of thousands of people going through it. And as you kind of listen to this, maybe keeping at that level of you know we're going to work on salespeople, we're going to work on uh, a certain function in our in our manufacturing plant. We're going to work on a, you know, financial advisors. It's really at that level that we're going to be talking, rather than you know, I have an activity. How do I structure that activity? That's something that's really more in the real fine details. And we're going to stay up at this level of saying, you know, I, I've got 100 salespeople out here, and it's just taking us too long to get them functioning at the level we want them to function at. That's really kind of what we're talking about. Is how do we really shrink that time? And let me get to the next slide here. 
And again, we'll have plenty of time for, for questions. Um, learning, the, the methodology really has a very heavy basis in the quality movement. And those people who are familiar with Six Sigma and Kaizen and all that are, are going to recognize some things here uh, because they're really taking a process approach to things. And one of the things that I learned from Six Sigma was that you really want to start with a business case. And what's nice about this is a friend of mine said, you know, you need to learn to speak the language of, the, of business. And the language of business is money. And what executives want to hear is, you know, what is the financial case for, for, for what you're doing? And this is the financial case we're going to talk about. And this is something that we can easily measure. And the other thing is, you know, there's always this thing about, you know, how do you measure the effectiveness of training? One of the things that I have learned is that if you start by going after the measures, it's easier to track and see if you actually get there as opposed to doing some training and saying, gee, what happened? Here we're saying, hey, we're going to get those people up to speed, the salespeople up to speed faster, and it's going to mean more sales. That is an easier thing to work from. And if you think about any any job that you might be working on, you think, you know, what is the cost of having one of those people not 100% proficient? You know, if I've got someone, I know in manufacturing, the, the, the cost is I've got people out there who aren't really safe, and we are more likely to have an accident, and that is a tremendous cost. You know, if you think if you're in a call center, and I have, I've got a few hundred people taking calls to customers, and I now have less than proficient people out there, which means that, you know, maybe they know, maybe 70 to 80% of the answers they give to customers are right. That extra 20% is really significant in terms of, you know, lost opportunities, you're alienating customers, um, you know, just you go really think about in any particular job or position that that uh, you know, if, if you're really not to where you need to be, it's expensive. And what I've experienced with executives is they really get that. Um, it's not a thing that they really have to do a lot of measurements because they it keeps them up at night. And if you have a great answer, and that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and and um, let me just let's just start with a quick poll question just to to kind of go with that thought. So if you think you, know, you may have had this conversation about, you know, well, what, what do you think a passing score should be? So if we're going to test people's proficiency, what do you think a passing score should be? And I've given you four potential uh, responses. So go ahead and type something in. All right, so I've got that poll up on the screen. You guys can go ahead and just click right on the screen uh, to vote and participate. Uh, there's those options for 50%, 75%, 90%, 100%. Uh, it doesn't go lower than 50, so uh, that should should help a little bit. <laughs> uh, let's see, it looks like a good portion of you have voted. I'll give you about three more seconds here. Yeah, Andrew, we should have put in participation trophy. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm sorry. I should have listed that. Um, here's those results, though. 0% uh, suggested 50%. 27% of our audience said it should be 75%. 29% of our audience said 100%. And 45% of our audience said 90%. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we're going to stress here in talking about proficiency is that there are so many jobs where getting something wrong isn't an option. And, and one of in, in, the, in the new book, one of the examples I use is about um, uh, an airline pilot. And he gets on and says, you know, it's a great sunny day and we're headed down to, to Miami. And I just want to let you know that I got 85% of my landing test. Well, I think everyone is now getting off the plane. There are a lot of things in a lot of jobs where 100% is the only thing it can be. And again, this is not a goal when we talk proficiency. It's saying, you know, we're really going to try and get everybody to 100% because if they're not there, it's costing us money. That's kind of the point. So let me move on to the next uh, question here, which will now support that. And we'll give you a chance to write in your answers. Uh, one of the places I also, along with the business case, one of the places I like to start is talking about learning principles. And these are the things that drive learning organizations. I found they're the things that for people uh, who want to, you know, work more with executives. This is how you assume a position of being the expert in learning. And the first thing you need to do is be able to really articulate what do you believe is absolutely true about how people learn? That would be a learning principle. 
And we're going to show you how learning paths here in our methodology is based in some learning principles. But just take a quick chance to type in something about what do you believe is absolutely 100% true about how people learn? All right, so we'll give you guys a few moments to type. Um, all right, here they come. So uh, one is that people learn by doing. Another is learning styles do not exist, but people do have preferences. Uh, the people are continuously learning. Practice is important. Uh, experience is important. People, again, people learn by doing. That one's being passed up a lot. Uh, Everyone learns differently is another one. Must be motivated to learn. People don't always want to learn. Uh, problem solving is a, is a useful learning tool. Motivation and emotion is indispensable. It's another one. Clear learning objectives and with practice and assessments are important and essential. The learning must be relevant. Don't learn about something that's not relevant. Um, and then more and more uh, people echoing in different ways that learning by doing is important. Great. You know, I, I think all those are great examples of what a learning principle is. Uh, and we won't get into whether we agree or disagree. It's really not the, 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 the point here. And what I would recommend to anyone who's going, who's either leading or going to lead a learning organization is that they clearly articulate their set of learning principles. They, they write them up, they post them on the wall, and they say every piece of training we do from here forward has to fit these principles. And it really works nice when you bring in vendors to say, you know, I, I know you have all these theories and models, but this is what we believe is true. And all our training will start to look similar. It will go in the same direction. Okay, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very important thing for building a good learning organization. Let me get to the next slide and I'll show where we're going with this. Um, what I've done is, is, is for learning passes, I've selected three learning principles to drive everything. And one of the reasons why it's three is in many cases, that's all people are really going to remember. You know, if I gave you 10 principles at the end of the hour here, you might remember one or two. So I got a little better shot if I do three. And these are the three overwhelming principles about what we're going to do. Let me just go through those. Number one is that learning is a process and not an event. What that means is it takes more than just going through two hour, a two-hour course or reading a book to really be good at something. It takes that, that hands-on. It takes that practice. It takes a series of things. Uh, and then and, uh, you can see our training would look different than if I said, you know, it, all it is is, is good e-learning. That's different. It looks different. This is saying, you know, we really have to have a process and we have to have it complete enough to get from point A to point B. Number two uh, is that knowing and doing are not the same. And I can't tell you how many times I've sat down to start a training program and people want to tell you what people need to know. And, and we stop and say, well, what's really important is what can they do? Just knowing something doesn't mean it goes into action. And so if we, if we focus on the doing side, we'll, we'll get all that knowing stuff out of the way, but we'll actually have accomplished something that's meaningful and gets us to proficiency. And the third one is that training should be by design and not by accident. Everything I've read is that, you know, uh, informal learning takes up about 60, 70, 80 percent of, of all learning. But it, it's it's in, it, since it's informal, no one really kind of knows what's going on and it's different for everybody. And we're saying, gee, if we could just do something to make that more by design, we really could do a lot better job and really pick up the pace. Because a lot of that wandering around kind of learning, um, you know, some of it doesn't get you where you want to go or takes too long. You know, why don't we rely on the experts to say, you know, if you really want to do this the right way, uh, here's the way to do it. It's a little like I, I, the example of, uh, if you remember the movie uh, Karate Kid, and I know that's starting to date myself, but, you know, there's the Mr. Miyagi has a way of teaching karate, which is a little bit different, but he says, you know, this is, this is the very disciplined way of learning it. Uh, you know, that's the wax the car and the paint the fence. So let me just stop here and see if there are any questions. No additional questions at this time. Okay, let me plow ahead. So in what we're talking about, I want to talk about kind of three key concepts. 
we've kind of talked already a little bit about time to proficiency. In other words, the time it takes to become proficient, which means that we really need to spend some time on discussing, well, what do we mean by proficiency? And then how do we get there? And the learning path is really, how do we go from wherever we start to becoming proficient? So we'll go through those three things uh, in, our, in our session today. So proficiency. Uh, anytime we use terms in training, everybody's got a different definition. And so what we've tried to do over the last 20 years is try to get people to conform more to how we define it, because it helps us work on it together. We're all kind of on the same page. And, and I would suggest to do any learning uh, kind of project, it's great to get your terms defined right up front. So how we define proficiency is that proficiency is a, a level of performance. Okay, and, and, and typically it consists of things like, you're we talking about output, uh, how much quality, how good, speed, how fast. And in manufacturing and a lot of environments, safety is a key component. Uh, I just did one for financial advisors, and, and for them, compliance is a big one. In, in the plant, they're, the, they're more interested in what OSHA wants them to do, and in financial um, advisor arenas, they're more interested in what the SEC wants them to do, but it's all about, I got I to gotta get up to this level and do it in a certain way to be considered proficient. And I, I've separated out here what I would call the independent worker. So if we take someone who's brand new, they're going to get up to a level where I kind of define it as I can now go home and not have to worry about you. There's a certain level of performance there. It's not this, you know, ultimate goal of perfection, but saying for, for our, our new people, this is where they have to be 100%. You can see above that, there's a line for top performance saying, well, if I have people at that level, I can now create a new definition for a top performer, and then I can create a new learning path to get there. So. Um, let me just go to the next slide and we'll take some questions. Um, I just want to talk for a second about speed because people often confuse speed with being reckless or careless. And what we're really talking about in speed or time, shrinking time is that, uh, you know, a couple of things. One is that as people get better at something, they naturally get faster at it. After you practice something a hundred times, it, it goes faster. And it's kind of a, a measure of, of of getting better. It doesn't mean that I'm I'm flailing around. It means that you know I, I may have figured out how to how to you know organize my time. I may have figured out you know what steps go in one or things to make you faster. Uh, the second is um, you know in shrinking the overall time. I, I have found that that the number one way to speed things up is to do things right the first time. It's all that retraining. Um, and, you know, I didn't quite get it or we didn't quite get to, to proficiency and I got to do it again and do it again. That takes tremendous amounts of time. And if you get to lay it out in a way that people actually, you know, do it in a single pass much, much faster. So um, let me just skip ahead here. Um, and I'm going to give you just a little bit more on proficiency and then we'll stop and get questions. Uh, this is just some examples from a manufacturing environment of kind of what are the measures of the things that go into a proficiency statement. Um, you know, you look at the output is how many of those things, how, how, how many do I get produced in a day? You know, for salespeople, it's, you know, what do I sell? What's the profitability? What kind of product mix is there? Uh, quality, um, you know, most jobs have some kind of quality standards or performance standards. Those are just some from, from manufacturing. And then you've got your speed and safety ones as well. And, and again, the safety might be something like compliance or you might have safety and compliance. And one of the things that you're gonna to start to see as we build uh, proficiency statements or, or talk about it, is we're gonna start putting in actual numbers. And that's gonna really distinguish these things. So if you, if you get a proficiency statement, which I'm gonna show you in a second here, um, you know, we're going to put in the measurables and say we're going to this measure and again that helps you so let me just quickly stop because i run through a, a bunch of material here are there any questions at this point um one question has popped up here do you worry that when people get faster at something because they they know it well that they might overlook any new changes that have been made um you know i think it's not necessarily the point of getting 
faster at it, but you know, if, if people are just trying to go fast to be reckless uh, or, or, you know, just pushing themselves to be fast, you can get that kind of thing. But if you're actually doing the training well, uh, you know, people will become faster because they're doing, a lot of times doing it right makes you faster. You know, it's the idea I didn't have to redo something. I, I didn't end up with with excess waste, waste or scrap because I did it right. I am faster now. I did, you know, I just I did it once. I am now faster. A anything else, Andrew? Another one: people can become complacent, and that's when mistakes can happen. So I, I think it all just comes down to uh, to with proficiency. Uh, people may become an expert and then and then just skip over pass over or not pay attention to any changes I think that's the general concern here well, there's another person that echoed that yeah. well you know what we're really focusing at this level what is getting people to do it right uh, to do it you know at, 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 a, at a required speed level once you get there once you've had that training and once you've proven you can do it then you have a whole field of performance management that will work on, you know, how do we maintain this level? Uh, how do we prevent complacency? And and I think that's more in the arena of, of performance management. You know, uh, here we're taking people who have, you know, have not done this correctly before, and we're gonna get them to do it correctly and at the same, the correct pace. And then of course, you gotta have management to manage people. Anything else, Andrew? Nope, those are all the questions at this time. Right. Let me push ahead. Um, one of the things that often comes up is the difference between comp competencies and proficiencies. And there are a lot of organizations that have done a lot, done a lot of competency work and some that have done none. And I just want to mention this, that there is a, a, a big distinction between the two, that competencies tend to be, and again, everyone defines these things differently, about skills, knowledge, and attitudes. And in that little column, you know, you know, understands the issues and trends of our industry is a competency. Um, and when we talk about proficiency, we're talking more about the, the, the results and the observable actions. And you see what I've written there about, well, what we really want people to do is not to understand the, the issues, but to actually put those issues into action as far as how they create their marketing plan and how that gets used. So there's that real doing component to it. Uh, you know, and, and there's just some other examples side by side here saying, you know, competencies are, are okay, but it's this is proficiency are almost up a level a little bit. And a lot of times, what happens to the competencies is that uh, they break everything apart enough that you lose how they all go back together again. And the proficiency statements are, are, are cover more things that are more the complete action. And, and the, the, the other thing I keep reinforcing is that I have seldom seen in the competency statement any numbers. You know, I don't see 10% of this or six of these. Uh, they, they tend to be more general, which makes them much harder to measure. And in uh, a proficiency statement, you're going to have all those numbers. So proficiencies are more like performance statements. They're not goals because we're not, you know, trying to push people to a new level. We're trying to say, here's where you have to be. So just a quick thing about you know, competency and proficiencies. Um, I think I'm going to move on because it's the kind of thing we could spend an hour discussing uh, and maybe arguing, but the point is that we're going to focus on proficiency. Okay. So the second concept is the idea of a learning path. And again, I've seen a thousand definitions for a learning path. I'm going to talk about how we define it. And we find it, define it this way because it's helpful to do what we're trying to do. Um, and so what a learning path is, are all the learning activities that go from the time you start until the time you become proficient. It's everything. And they're just on the right-hand side, just a small sample of what might be a learning activity. Um, you know, and I'm sure the people here involved in building training, you have all sorts of activities and they're informal and they're formal and they're social and they're experiential. And we're saying that whole universe of activities that go from start to finish is a learning path and that there is some kind of order to that that gets people through quickly. And of course, in reducing time for efficiency, we're trying to speed up this timeline. And we'll talk about how we kind of do some of that stuff. 
So let me just stop there and, and ask if there are any questions about what is a learning path. Any questions about the slide or what is a learning path? It doesn't look like we have any now. Um, okay. So if you guys do have more questions, let us know and we'll bring them up uh, after you ask them. Great. So uh, let me just ask a quick poll question, Angela, let's take this one about, you know, we keep talking about, you know, the classroom and the formal stuff and the informal stuff. What percentage do you think is in, in your environment? And there's no correct answer because it's more depends on your experience. Uh, uh, how much is of, of training or learning is informal? or on the job? This is a great question. We're, we're not really getting a, a wide response, a wide range of responses. Uh, the, there's a definite majority on one of these. Um, but I wanna give you guys an opp full opportunity to vote. So we'll give you guys a couple more seconds to jump in there. 10%, the same book that I read. All right, three, two, one, and here's those results. 61% uh, of our audience said 70%, 25% of our audience said 50%, and 13 said 30%. So there's definitely an agreement here that uh, it's it's more rather than less. Good, and, and I think in the practical experience rather than the what's in the book, is saying you know it's a lot and it's a lot more than you may think it is. That uh, you know that how do I transfer things to on the job? How much practice do I really need? There's probably a lot more of it than we actually think, and we start to really map it out. You're sometimes surprised about, you know, how 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 it kind of overwhelms things. Good. That kind of sets up what we're going to talk about. Um, so we talk about reducing time to efficiency, and, and what I want to talk about a little bit is, you know, what are the the major opportunities to really make a big difference? And our experience is that we tend to get on an initial pass about 30 to 50 percent reduction but when you see how that's all done you say you know that there's just that much in you know, low-hanging fruit and, and just redoing things that we really can make some huge jumps and let me explain from this chart which is kind of a foundational chart that we use is that what i've seen in almost every environment is that you start off on the first day and if you're a new person it's it's day one but it could be you know I've got some experienced people and we're gonna go through you know, a higher level. And what happens is you go through some kind of formal training. It could be a day, it could be a week, it could be six weeks, it could be six months. Uh, you know, There's a lot of classroom, there's a lot of e-learning and you get to what I call graduation day. And that's the day you get your certificate and you get the party hats and, and maybe some cake and you're at a certain level. But if you think about where proficiency is, it tends to be way far out in the future. And you can see I've got that next line called Independence Day. That's the day, you know, you're actually using it the way it should be on the job. You've actually changed how you work. You're hitting the numbers. That's way out in the future. Uh, and so what lies in between is what we call the mystery period. And we call it the mystery period because it's often very unclear what's happening. It's different for everybody. You know, I know we work a lot in manufacturing. It's different on every single shift and every single supervisor. If you have, uh, you know, in your, if you're in a call center, it might be different by every little work group that you're working with and, and saying, you know, we really don't know what's going on there. And if we had some way of, of making that more by, more on, uh, uh, you know, by design, there's just a lot that we can shrink out of it. There's a lot of stuff in there that's just simply unnecessary. You know, I worked on somewhere they were teaching things that they no longer did. And so you're able to kind of just shrink that down. And that fits with that large amount of informal stuff. Most of it's happening in that mystery period. And, and we talk about it being filled with waste and variability. Uh, and just a quick reminder, waste really means things that don't add value. So stuff that, that I'm taught that I don't actually use or no one checks up on, that's waste. And when it's different for everybody, you know, if everybody gets something different, that's variability. And all those things, you know, drive the amount of time it takes. And so sometimes it's not a matter of coming up with some great activity. It's a matter of putting some structure to things, getting rid of things that don't work, getting us all on the same page. When we went to that idea that learning is a process, not an event, uh, 
what we learned from process improvement is that you kind of have to define a single process and then make it better instead of saying you know it's everyone's on their own it's all different it's real hard to make that better so um let me just push ahead here this slide just talks a little bit more about what are some of those ways of making it faster and we talked really about the first two here uh, often we start laying out a learning path on all the different activities we find that there are many paths many different ways people are doing it and just getting on the same page will make things go faster getting rid of the mystery period um you know as you start looking at it particularly looking at the informal stuff there may be a lot of things that are missing there might be things that aren't necessary we could do that and the last one here we talk about sequence uh, when we sit with the experts in a particular job they'll start to help you figure out you know this is the correct way to learn this thing to do it um, in this sequence not saying you know a lot of times it's real convenient just to you know give you all the knowledge stuff all at once and then do some practice and then go get some experience but that's a hard way to learn uh, getting that sequence right of saying here's the way to do it you know marty is really big on on um, micro learning and nano coaching that you know taking a lot of these big chunks and getting them into a smaller sequence really speed things up so before we go on any, any more questions about uh learning paths and reducing the time uh, to proficiency before we move on no new questions have come in um one person brings up that i think the definitions of informal and on-the-job training are vastly different um so yeah i mean there's there's a couple more thoughts coming in but but no new questions good and, and i would say that you know if in working on things like this if you want to have one category that says informal one that says on the job that's great uh, the big point i'm trying to make is that you got to include everything and you got to look at that stuff you know even more uh, and, and i and again if you get your definitions agreed upon in your group it'll make a lot of difference because in other in some places they put them together in other places they put it apart uh what's important is that we all work on that stuff and that we all have a definition about it so i appreciate what you said um this is a little example i just want to give about um you know getting the sequence right and this actually i learned this a lot when i worked at the company called valspar they're the people who make paint and the idea of of this idea of just in time which is sort of another quality concept of, of we, you know we, we tend to remember and use things when they're real close to when you actually have to use them on the job and what typically happens in uh, manufacturing training is that you get all your safety stuff on the first couple of days you know and it may be very intensive but you may not use it for a while. And at, in this company, they would teach, you needed a respirator to do this job, but they realized that you would not get into a confined space where you needed one for almost six weeks. And so what they had to do is they needed to, they did their initial training and then they had to retrain it six weeks later. And if you look at their current learning path, and they've done this with almost everything around safety, yet in week six, they have a designated activity where you go into a confined space and right before it they teach you your respirator and you, you, you talk about motivation you have a lot of people's attention when you show them the confined space and say you're going to need a respirator do you want to pay attention uh it, it the the training is so much better and it sticks because the two things are together and to be able to go through an entire learning path and say, well how do we make the whole thing more just in time that we're not giving people so much stuff that they're going to forget it before they use it and they're not going to use it enough to really get good at it and so what you find is that there's a lot more practice being put in there's a lot more hands-on training put in uh, uh, and, and people start to think about this activity should have come before that activity um, rather than the other way around or that we just need a bunch of knowledge and then we hope we can practice so and, and for, for them one of the things that they measured was uh, supervisor time and they found by going to this approach they dramatically reduced the amount of time supervisors spent in retraining you know it was really negligible by the time they get done because they they really only have to do it once you know and if they did it twice that was okay 
but they weren't doing it five and six times. And people weren't forgetting one thing while they were learning something else. Okay, so let me let me push ahead here a little bit. But that's just one example. If we just looked at our uh, uh, math out our learning path and said, gee, how can we make this whole thing more just in time? Big improvement. Okay, so uh, let me just back up here a second. Th that kind of cuts off just through the general definition of learning path proficiency and this idea of time to you know time to proficiency any more comments or questions about these definitions or what we've talked about one question has come up how would you approach creating a learning path for a department that does not want to standardize for example a sales department has different types of events but they don't want uh but they do not all go to the same types of events mm -hmm. well you know a, a lot of you know, getting people onto the same page and starting to standardize really is something that comes from higher up in the organization. And, you know, my experience is when we get the senior salespeople involved or the senior sales executives are even up, that's where we start to make those changes. Uh, I can appreciate it. it's very difficult when they just tell you, you know, do this and that to actually get that done. So there is sort of a, an executive commitment to do this kind of stuff. Um, because it's 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 but you know and again it's it's explaining the business case to them it's explaining you know why being more standardized is is going to make things easier and faster um uh, it's going to you're going to the guys are going to sell more if they do it this way um uh, and that'll be different for every organization but you know it's a, that's it is a tough sales job to do that but it is the, the right way to kind of do things um Okay, uh, anything else, Andrew? Nothing more at this time. Okay. And if I'm not fully answering your questions, you can always type in another question and, you know, and I'll try to take another shot at it. So here's the process we use. So say, you know, those are the, the concepts and the terms. How do you actually get one of these things done? How, how, do, you, how do you work on these things? And, and this idea of, you know, getting support for things comes into the process itself. So where we start with this is we select a function, task, or job. Um, you know, that's usually the best way to work on things. So this is the the, the salespeople, this is the the operators in the plant, this is um, the people taking calls in the call center, this is customer service, you know, whatever. And and selecting that function is 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 looking for you know kind of who has the greatest need in the organization and where is it going to make the greatest impact we always try and find something that that really is going to deliver some results but i'll tell you that the number one <coughs> thing we look for is is there a project champion is there some kind of senior executive who really wants to do this who really you know the the output of this affects them financially and, and their budgets and they will help drive this and from there we go and we, we form a, a learning path team, which is a lot like we used to do in quality or if you're doing Kaizans, where we get the stakeholders together to work on this. So we're trying to involve the experts up front and the people with the stake up front so that they take ownership and so they're not going to give you as much resistance when you're all done. From there we define proficiency. We actually get a, a proficiency statement, which I'll show you here in a second. And once we have that mapped out, now we have where we're going. Instead of saying, now, let's go build something, you know, the blank piece of paper, say, no, why don't we start by looking at what currently exists? Because people are doing it somehow today. And we map that out. We get all that sequence of activity. And in that activity, because there's a lot of differences, we can kind of get a best practice current path. We kind of negotiate through with the team saying, yeah, this is kind of the best of what we have right now. And once you have that laid out, you're able to then look for the opportunities for improvement. And I will tell you, once you get it laid out as learning and development experts, you're gonna see all sorts of things. You know, as when we did a lot of these projects, it was not unusual to find 50 or 100 different things that would make it go you know, faster and they were not, you know, build, you know, 70 hours of workshops. It, it really, there were a lot of things working with what existed so we go through that we prioritize that stuff we say you know here's how we're going to get a, a 
uh, a quick gain in the system because we know we can come back as this is continuous improvement and do another round to get another 30 percent we take those opportunities and we upgrade the learning path it says you know here's here's what the new learning path looks like uh here all here's the new sequence of activities that then it should be at least 30 percent faster uh and again we're getting the team to agree on that and then for every item every activity we start to build what we call uh, uh learning uh, activity descriptions and if that's informal stuff or if it's on the job or if it's social we're actually starting to write the instructions for how that's done so it just doesn't go on a joint call it actually is the structure of the joint call okay and and, and there might be tools that goes with it. it starts to formalize all the informal stuff it coordinates in and and, and makes more robust some of the existing um, formal activities and i'll tell you that what typically happens the first time around is we're probably spending more of our time on the informal and the social and experiential and the hands-on stuff than in building workshops we might go in and, and take a look at, at some existing trainings you know some of the stuff is out of order and we can split it apart we can combine it with something else so there's a lot of things that you can do and then we go through a process of, of implementation and maintenance where we do our measurement and all that so that is the the process that we use we try to to put into it as much stuff about change management as we can so that we start getting accept, acceptance for things you know if you can get your learning path team to have ownership of this your chances of getting it implemented successfully you know go up exponentially so let me just stop there and take any questions all right there's a question here uh how effective is micro learning and mobile learning activities to reduce in-class time and produce better on-the-job results? And do they support better proficiency results? Um, you know, my experience is that they do. Uh, and when we've added that stuff in and, and thought about how we do it, you know, again, that's getting that things more just in time. It's it's making sure that people haven't forgotten what's there. Um, but in, in a, uh, you know, true kind of quality orientation, we say, let's try it and test it. And if it works, we'll keep it. And if it doesn't work, we'll change it or, or modify it. But I think you got to be real creative about that stuff and say, you know, you know, the research says that does does that. Our experience says it does that. Let's try and put it in. And again, we're we're not saying the first time around we're going to have the world's perfect path here. We're just going to have one that's a lot better. So you know, I support those ideas of of taking a look at, um, you know, can we can we we. Uh, you know, do more micro learning. Can we do more different delivery things to, to make it work better? Uh, Marty, who was on earlier, is very big on what he calls nano coaching, and he may talk about that in a bit. Uh, so, yeah, I think you're on the right track. Anything else? Excellent. Another question came up Is it best to build the learning path up front and then create the learning activities that fall within the learning path? Or do you build your learning activities like e-learning, classroom learning, job aids, et cetera, and then build your learning path? Or does it really make a difference? Oh, yeah. No, it's, for us, it's, it's definitely, you know, the, the learning path is more of the higher level. It's it's the overall structure. It's, it's identifying what the activities are. And you want to get that all set first before you start building anything. You know, because uh, you might be going and say, you know, this would really be good in e-learning. And then you start mapping the rest and say, well, that doesn't work out as well we should have done this so it, it it really the learning path provides the the blueprint and then the actual you know substance of stuff is going to get into your activities and and uh so i would definitely you know and, and when we do these things we actually take people through the process that way all right Anything else? great that's all we've got at this time okay Let's plow ahead a little bit and move along. Um, I'm just going to go backwards with a little more detail for everyone. When we talk about defining proficiency, uh, we build a proficiency statement or a definition. And what that is, is a series of statements uh, that completely describe you know, what proficiency looks like. And it tends to be somewhere between you know, 30 to 50 statements. 
because we tend to be dealing with jobs. And you can see in here's just a couple of different ones. Uh, I've got two pages of this, as you can see. Each one is a different job, as you can kind of see there. And I'll point out, you know, look, look at the numbers. There's all sorts of numbers in these things. And that helps us measure things. And then I did want to point out the second column about milestones. And this is really going to help us build our assessments. <clears throat> the idea of milestones is that you don't become proficient in everything on the last day. So if it takes eight months to become proficient, it doesn't mean all comes together in eight months. It happens over time. And if you can identify, you know, this stuff has to be done by month three. And you can see the first and the first one, the first three of them are month three. I can now build a month three assessment and say, where are we on those three things? You have to be done by now. And then I can make my, my adjustments. And so it's very, very helpful. And you know, as you do, as you implement more and more of the learning paths and put more people through it, you get really good at when those milestones are. Um, you know, initially sometimes we're we're just kind of putting a stake in the sand. We run them and then we come back and adjust because you just simply wouldn't know it accurately. Uh, let me flip to the next page and give you a couple more of these. Here's two additional jobs. And you can see some people are involved in leadership. There's some stuff from the bottom there. Um, and these are actually ones from actual customers. Now, each of those jobs would probably have another 30 or 40 statements for the other parts of the job. Okay. Any comments about the proficiency statements? There's a more questions about building your learning path. Uh, at what level would you build the learning path? At an individual level, at a skill level, at a job role level? We tend to build them at, at, as, as job roles because we're, you know, in essence, trying to get, you know, a number of people up to speed in that job and and uh i didn't really talk about customizing it let me that might help uh, when we build a, a a learning path for a job we really are, are kind of including everything from start to finish now instead of having to build new ones for every individual what that allows us to do in customizing and say okay we'll take a look at everything you have already completed six of these things. We will take them off the learning path for you, and yours will be different. So we're customizing by deleting rather than trying to create a new path for everybody. And it works very, very well. And it's it's a much easier customizing process to eliminate items because we know if you had nothing, you'd have to have all of it. And so if I have 20 years experience on this, I probably can take some things off the path. And that's how we kind of work with that. Anything else, Andrew? There's a comment here. The, the proficiency statements look similar to criterion objectives. Um, you know, hopefully these are a little higher level than the criterion objectives. And, and again, people have different names for different things. And we may be, you know, someone else may think a criterion objective is something else. And so, again, this is getting our language straight. Sometimes when we get to the objective level, they tend to be more of what we're doing in individual activities rather than the overall job role. Um, but that's the kind of thing that, that, you know, in the first few meetings, we just kind of negotiate through that to make sure we're all on the same page and our definitions are the same. And, and if you've got all that stuff already done, you may find you have a lot of this work you know, it's, it's a quicker road to getting this work done. All right, great. That's all the questions we have right now. Okay, let's push ahead because I want to get to the track stuff. So just a summary slide about what a proficiency definition is and isn't. And I think we've done a pretty good job of, of this. But uh, again, uh, you know, it's, it's really that outcome results that, you know, performance measures and not the individual skills, knowledge, and attitudes kind of things. And they're not goals. They're actually things that people can produce. Uh, you know, uh, goals goals are, are something different. That's something we, we, in many cases, goals are things that maybe no one's ever done before. 
And sometimes they're not even possible. So we're not focused on that. We're saying we're taking people to places we know you have to be. And this is just a recap of just more examples of what learning activities are. And I don't think I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, but I would think that if you sat down and expanded this list, you would get a thousand items on this list. Okay. Uh, and again, we've talked a little about the sequence of, of, of activities and the idea of an, and mapping a current path. You know, we, we kind of come up with the best practice because there's usually multiple ones. Uh, uh, let me just press ahead here. Uh, and again, this is more of a summary slide, but you know, our whole goal, goal here is that we're trying to reduce time. Uh, we're looking at ways to get rid of the, the variability that we're all doing things differently and that we're trying to get rid of things that don't make a lot of sense. And in that, there's just a lot of things that get better. And we think that if we get what we do gets people to actually use it on the job that we don't have to tell you over and over again and that there isn't all this wandering around things are going to go a lot lot faster and again those three are just more a summary we talked to you about and i think i've covered a lot of that uh, we'll just leave it up here so you can take a quick look and the interesting is, is these these are kind of the, the terms of working on quality and working on processes and what I found is we get outside the training departments, people understand these terms better than the training terms, and it helps them. Okay. Uh, a final slide on what a learning path is and isn't. This is not a curriculum. It's not a course catalog. Um, you know, I, I talked a second about pick and choose. It, it's become very popular to try and put things up where people can kind of pick how they're going to learn things and I want this and then I'm going to do that and learning paths are the way we're putting it, are, are very different than that we're saying that instead of doing that instead of relying on the inexperienced learner to decide what to do next that we really want to take a look at the experts who've done it well and have gotten to where they want to say and say what is the best way to go through this you know what is the fast way what makes the most sense and building it that way and we think that actually is a lot faster than, you know, people often choose what's comfortable, what they understand. Uh, sometimes they just pick something. And we think that's not really a good reason. Uh, instead, saying, you know, the, the master has learned something over the years. Why don't we do it more like that? So pressing ahead. Um, this is where we want, we want to talk a little bit about how we've started to deliver this stuff on, online. And I think what I'd like to do here, just stop for a second, Marty. And if you want to just give a quick statement or two about Trek, and then I'll jump into the example. Uh, sure, happy to do that. Yeah, so, um, you know, basically the idea of Trek was we started building basically learning paths for our clients and uh, a, a variation of them. And recognize that, it, you know, you have all this paper or you have these things in PDFs or something like that. How do you track all that stuff that happens in the middle, in the mystery period, right? How do you know, how do you make that stuff organized? How do you automate it? How do you get reporting and knowing what's going on? And there wasn't a tool available, so we just called Trek, and it's become a, a tool that's now available to, to the public and, uh, you know, it, now through eLearning Brothers. Uh, that enables you to to set up these learning paths, to manage them, to track them, and set up what, this idea of this nano coaching process where you can capture what you've done and then uh, it automatically route it to whoever set up as your coach to give you feedback on that. And so it kind of basically automates taking the, the learning path and making it happen in a very systematic way and providing that visibility of what's going on out in the job as well. So, so this is an example of one of uh, our, the clients uh, that Steve worked with with us with Trek and Upanor and a manufacturing client where they applied Steve's methodology, but use and use and are using Trek to uh, implement that. Great, thank you, thank you, Marty. That's a, a good setup. Um, what, what I wanted to give you was some examples of how stuff actually gets delivered, and you know, kind of what some people have done. And uh, one of the 
big ones that Marty and I have done is for this company called Uponar, which makes PEX plumbing piping. And uh, they're actually a company from Finland, but they have a major plant here in uh, uh, Egan, Minnesota. And this is a this is one of their learning paths, which is the people who are actually it's a it's a plastic extrusion process, and these people are actually operating that piece of it. And what you can see here from and this is from Trek, it's a screenshot, is that uh, they basically have a five week learning path. And it kind of goes to start to finish, and then it works through a series of drop down menus that come up with the activities. So you can see under week one, there's a whole bunch of activities there in a, in a sequence. Uh, when you see the pencil, it means that there's only one part to the activity, and the ones that don't have the pencil have many parts of the activity. There could be two, three, or four. And this is guiding, because uh, in their environment, almost all the training is done by a, by a floor trainer working with one or two uh, employees. And they go through this thing together. And so when you actually you know, separate out, there, there are probably about 70 activities in these five weeks. And it covers their coaching time and their practice. And you can see that there's, there is set aside activities about practice and coaching. Uh, and, and one of the things that was real interesting about this job and kind of applies to a, a number of other jobs is that they quickly experienced that um, you know, one group of trainers was training uh, the tool changes first, and the other one was teaching the PEX process first. And then we got together and we discussed about, well, what really makes the most sense here? That, you know, because they were initially saying, well, it doesn't make any difference. What they discovered was that there were parts of the initial process that if you couldn't do it, you really couldn't do the job. And so there was no point of teaching you more. And one of those things is they have a thing called the pie tape, which measures the, the uh, diameter of the pipe. And if you couldn't do that, you know, and there are some people who can't, there's no reason to teach you a tool change because you won't be around to do that. Uh, uh, and there were a few other little things. That, and, and the other thing is this, those became very early in the, in the process because we wanted to make sure that you know, we have someone here who's actually going to be able to really handle this job before we go spend a lot of time on them. Um, and again, it, those are some things that it, it just, the amount of training you did had nothing to do with whether they were actually going to get it. it just, it's just like having certain spatial relationship kind of things. Um, and some of that ends up driving back more into the hiring process. But those are some of the things that they learned. And instead of this being kind of informal and everyone kind of the trainer kind of having to figure it out, they, they all agree now on this discipline process for how they were going to get these operators up to speed. And instead of taking eight weeks, it's taking five weeks. Um, they're finding that their long term proficiency or performance is much higher because we get them to this 100 percent early. Um, and I'll just and I'll just add that they're starting to uh, get some measurements in now too, where they're finding reductions in waste, things like that. And actually, mm -hmm. um, the the person who's uh, in charge of this, our client, has uh, has agreed to do a case study more specifically on their experience with this type of stuff. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get them in a future webinar. But uh, they're really seeing some concrete results that are quantifiable, and that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's interesting is is that. This is a job where you actually don't have a laptop or a computer of your own. And so to address that, the uh, client actually set up a number of kiosks in the plant, uh, which had a tablet. And so when they were going to work on this, they just go to the kiosk and it's right there and everybody, you know, can, can share that kind of data. And it was nice now they're able to report all this up the line kind of automatically. Well, where is everybody? What are they proficient at? What aren't they? Those are some of the other things. Let, let me show you another little example. Okay. Uh, this is for people who sell business insurance. This is a seven month path. And each one of these weeks, when you in the drop down, there are probably you know 10 activities. Overall, there's there's about 120 activities. This is a very complex job. Uh, and what we set 
here as a level of proficiency uh, was not, you know, the fact that you you were now selling at the maximum level. It's saying, you know, there's a point because this it, it for someone to really get proficient at this can be almost five years. We set a level that said, well, where do we have to be, or where does someone have to be to really have a confidence that this person is going to become a successful insurance broker? And they said it's around, we figured it was around seven months, and there are certain measures and things you have to hit. But if they got there and were proficient to that level, uh, they were they were very comfortable that the additional training, the additional two or three years, we, we have got someone who's going to be a winner here. And so there's a lot to this. As you can see, there's product training, there's sales training, there's um, process things, there's insurance and stuff. Uh, and this kind of puts it all in a sequence that makes the most sense that they can can really get a handle on it. So we've done a lot of talking here. Let's take a few questions about what we've shown so far. Well, we're running out of time. We're actually about three minutes over. So any more questions, we will take those afterwards and uh, okay. post them in the blog. Marty and I are good at talking. So, <laughs> uh, well, Andrew, why don't we turn it back over to you then? All right, great. I will uh, grab the screen here for a moment. Um, all right, so so what uh, the last of what I'll I'll share right now um, is is what you're seeing here on the screen that we do have a new free seven day trial here at eLearning Brothers. You can grab any ten assets from our library. Um, and, and on this vein of free, as we previously mentioned, we are also giving away uh, a copy of Steve's book. So we will get that emailed out to everybody. You can just click a link there and, and download his book for, your, for yourself. Also, if you want to learn more about Trek, um, right there in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, 801-796-2767, give us a call, mention this webinar, and we'd love to talk to you about Trek and, and the learning paths that uh, we here at eLearning Brothers has done. Our custom team does phenomenal work every day for all kinds of large clients, and we'd love to to show you some of our work and get you some ideas, if nothing else, of how you can change the way you are doing your work and your e-learning to uh, to follow better learning paths and to become a, a better e-learning creator. So you can visit eLearningBrothers.com, send us an email at info at eLearningBrothers.com, or just give us a call, 801-796-2767. Thank you, Marty and Steve, both for joining us on this webinar. We'll get uh, more questions answered in the, uh, the blog later in the week, and uh, those will come from Steve and Marty as well. So thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching this recording of Up to Speed, Secrets of Reducing Time to Proficiency. Subscribe to our channel to get more awesome presentations, ideas, and e-learning videos that can help you become an e-learning rock star. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and leave your comments below. And if you haven't already, check out our new free trial and choose any 10 assets from our massive library to download today. Visit eLearningBrothers.com. Thanks.